Well, good morning. It's good to be with you today. All right, before we jump in this morning, though, I just need to go ahead and tell you, I know a lot of you after this weekend, uh, your brackets are completely busted. All right, and so I just need you to put that out of your mind, Paul Harkle wrote, um, and, um, and just move on with the fact that Tennessee beat Duke, and it's just what happened, and, and you're just, it's just, it's gonna have to be okay, and, and so... Anyway, um, anyway, I just needed to get that out. I, I felt like it was important because I, I don't want you to be distracted this morning uh, by basketball because we've got an important passage of scripture to look at this morning in the book of Acts. So if you've brought your Bible with you, go ahead and open it up to Acts chapter 10 this morning. And if you do not have a copy of God's word, look in the pew back there in front of you. There is a Bible there. We would love for you to take that and make that yours and begin reading it and discovering the beautiful, amazing, powerful truths of God's word that are contained there. And so take that, mark it up, use it. That is our gift to you. But in Acts chapter 10, this is where we're going to find ourselves this morning. And we are going to see today that we're coming to another major movement in our journey through Acts when we get to the end of our section today. Last week, Garrett began that section by looking at a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And if you remember, last week or maybe you were gone on spring break and, and you weren't here, let me catch you up with what happened. Cornelius is a Roman centurion located in a region called Caesarea on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and he has a vision. He is described as a God-fearer. He has a vision from God that says, go get Peter, send people to get the apostle Peter to bring him to you. And so he does that very thing. And while his guys are traveling to a town called Joppa, where Peter is staying, Peter has a vision. And he has this vision of this giant sheet full of all these animals and reptiles and birds coming down from the clouds and, and, and a voice saying to him, kill and eat. And this vision has to happen three times. And Peter, he's not only appalled by the vision because it's full of things that he as a Jew would not have eaten, he's also kind of appalled by the instructions that tell him to kill and eat. And so he's struggling with this, but then the boy says, hey, there are some guys coming. I want you to go with them. And I want you to follow them back to, to where they ask you to go to meet with Cornelius. And so last week, Garrett did an incredible job of helping us see what, what is coming out in that text. And that is the gospel demands that we confront our prejudices, right? That if the gospel is for everybody, we've got to make sure that there aren't things that we are putting up in our lives that are barriers to us being able to share the gospel and being a witness to our neighbors and to the people that God has put around us. And he made a statement last week that I think bears repeating, and it is this right here. We may not understand or agree with everyone, but we must understand that the gospel is for everyone. Amen? And so this morning, we're gonna continue looking at Cornelius. So when we left off, these representatives from him have come to Joppa, they've stayed the night with Peter, and now they're getting ready to head back to Caesarea. And so the, the passage that we're looking at today, you're gonna see it helped me anyway. I don't know if it'll help you, but the way my brain was wired, it helped me to think through this in three sections. And so I've kind of given each section that we're gonna look at kind of a bottom line or something that I think the text wants us to see in these sections. And so the first little section that we're gonna look at beginning at the end of verse 23 is this right here, that there is the potential for gospel pollution in our lives. And we think we're gonna see that come out in the text. And what do we mean by that? It's that the purity of the gospel, when it is, has anything that takes our focus off of Christ, the gospel is polluted. If anything takes our focus off of who he is. And so I want you to follow along and be thinking about that as we read verses 23 through 29. Follow along in your Bible as I read. And it says here, and on the next day he got up and he went away with them. And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. And now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. 
And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and he fell at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I too am just a man. And he talked with him and he entered and he found many people assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. And that is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, for what reason have you sent for me? Now, I want you to look back because there's some details here that I think are so important for us to understand. And the first one is the location where Peter went. He went to a place called Caesarea. And this would be a picture of what what it might have looked like at this time uh, when Cornelius would have lived there. It is very Roman, okay? It would have been a reminder to the Jews that, Rome, that they were living in, in occupied territory. Rome had conquered them. They were under the control of Rome. And Caesarea was such an example of Roman culture and, and just how it was so anti-Jewish. Herod the Great had built this city. He had made a city that had no port to have a port so that he could get money coming in here on the coast of Israel. And so everything that a Roman would want would be at their fingertips here in Caesarea. And it would have been everything a Jew would have said was wrong and unholy and unclean. And so the very location where Peter is going bothers him. But it goes even deeper than that. The very next thing it says when he enters Caesarea, it says he's gathered together his friends and his relatives. Now, a Gentile, a Roman centurion, who do you think his friends and his relatives are? More Romans and more Gentiles, okay? So here we have even the people. Peter's, Peter's gonna be a little uncomfortable with the people that he is going to see. And then the next thing that happens, the the very first thing Cornelius does when he sees Peter is he bows down. He begins to bow. Peter would have been appalled by this, right? You worship no one but the one true God. And here Cornelius is trying to worship him. And so he's like, get up, don't do that. And so Peter's uncomfortable with this. And then the the no-no of all no-no's. Cornelius says, come into my house. A Jew would have never entered the home of a Gentile because it was unclean. And if a Jew were to enter that home, he would be unclean. And so right away, you could just imagine, and I think Luke really wants you to see that what Peter is seeing with everything he's experiencing when he enters Caesarea and meets Cornelius is unclean. Like it's just gotta be like alarm bells going off in his head. Unclean, unclean, unholy. And I think he's still, I think the text is gonna show us he's still thinking that even though he's had this vision from the Lord three times that says don't call anything that I've called clean unclean, Peter's still wrestling even as he enters Caesarea. Luke wants you to feel this tension in these verses because we're gonna see Peter's being obedient. He's doing what, what Christ has told him to do but I don't think we're convinced yet that his heart is in it. Because look at, look at what he says. I mean, his first words to Cornelius, right? God's told him to go, right? He's seen this incredible vision. He gets there, and, and the first thing he says to Cornelius and all of his family and friends that have gathered, look at what it says in verse 28. You yourselves know it's unlawful for me to even be here. I mean, what an opening statement. I mean, think about that, right? You've invited this man into your home. He's standing there and he's thinking, I just need you to know I shouldn't be here. I don't really wanna be here, right? God told me to come, so I'm here, but I don't know that I'm real happy about being here, right? Why would he lead with a statement like that if he's not still really wrestling with the question, what am I doing here? Right, I mean, clearly Peter's allegiance is to Christ because he's done it, he's gone. But we're not real sure that his heart's in it. Because look at what he goes on to say. He says, it's unlawful for me as a Jew to associate with you a foreigner. 
but God has shown me, right, that I shouldn't call anything unclean that God is called clean, right? It's a reminder back, Garrett referred to this last week out of Mark chapter seven, where Jesus tells his disciples, right, that it's not what a man puts into his body that makes him unclean, right? So it's not a food thing, it's not a dietary thing, right? But it's what comes out of the heart that makes a man unclean. So Peter has heard this, but Peter is still wrestling with applying this, right? So in Peter's life, there's this potential for the gospel to still be polluted, right? As, as, they are, as, as, as he is going and as he is going to take the message of Jesus, wherever he goes, he's still wrestling with, but does the gospel go here, right? Clean versus unclean. We could say it this way, superior versus inferior. I mean, is it possible that Peter feels like he is superior to Cornelius because of his religious activity as a Jew. Could it be? Could he still have a little bit of that looking down at Cornelius? Like, Cornelius, you do none of the things that please God. I do all of the things that please God, right? I'm one of Jesus's original 12, and not only that, I eat all the right stuff and I keep all the right festivals and I, I have all the right practices and I go to all the right places. Right, Cornelius, you do none of that stuff. There's a little bit of an air of that, right? And even it's unlawful for me to be here. Right? Is, that, is, that the, is that the clarity of the gospel that we would say is, is the message of Christ? that we would come to someone with that kind of a, an attitude or spirit about us. You see, this is a really critical moment for the church in its infancy, right? As they are crafting language about how they are communi gonna communicate who Christ is and what it is he came to do and who that gospel message is for, this is crucial. Right, is, is the gospel going to be polluted? That, that's the question here. If we were reading this for the first time, I mean, what is the gospel gonna say about this? Does the gospel go to the Romans? Is the gospel for those people who are unclean by Jewish standards, right? Is Christ's blood enough to save them? That's the question that he's wrestling with here. So, that's what Peter's wrestling with. And you say, okay, well, let's move on. Let's see what happens next. But before we do, we actually need to stop and say, do we wrestle with the same thing? Is this just an issue for the church in Acts or is this an issue for us? Let's take just a second and do a little self-assessment here of us today because here's what I know to be true in my life. And I bet if you're honest, it's true for you, is that we have a battle in us to be achievers and not believers. What do I mean by that? That we are very easily lured into this false religion of superiority through what we would call better religious activity, right? We may say Jesus is enough, but the way we live is that we have to do certain things. The things we do make us better than those who don't do those things, right? It's easy for us to get lured into being an achiever, not a believer, right? Well, go to a growth group. Well, but are you in a Bible study during the week, right? Attend church on Sunday morning. Well, do you come on Wednesday night? Right? Well, I wear this. Your dress is not what a Christian should wear. Right? Well, I do these things. Well, you don't do those things. Right? I volunteered to help this year at Bernie Bright. I serve every week. Right? I mean, all those kinds of things. Right? I dress like a good Christian. I vote like a good Christian. Right? I know how to use church words and you don't. Right? We do it, don't we? We are so prone to polluting the beauty of the gospel message by adding to it, yeah, it's about Jesus, but it's also about this list of things that make you a good Christian. We wrestle with the same thing that Peter was wrestling with here in the book of Acts. 
So how's the church gonna guard against it moving forward, right? How are we gonna guard against it moving forward? That takes us into the next section here, right? After, after Peter says, hey, why did you bring me here? Cornelius goes back and he tells him, hey, let me, re- let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you about my vision, right? Garrett covered that last week, so we're not gonna take time. We're gonna jump on down to verse 34 about what Peter says after Cornelius says, here's why I've brought you here. And in this section, we're gonna see that there is a pressing need for gospel clarity. That if, if, the, if there is the potential for the gospel to be polluted by something that takes our focus off of Christ, right, then we desperately need the clarity of the pure gospel message, the simple message of the gospel to help us guard against wrong beliefs and wrong practices. So look, look at verses 34. We're gonna read through 43. Peter, it says, he opened his mouth and said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. And the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the things which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. And you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things. He did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. And God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and to solemnly testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. There it is. There is the purity of the gospel in that last phrase. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. I I encourage you, go back and read that whole section again because it just drips beautiful language of the gospel. Who Jesus is, why he was the only sacrifice that could be our substitute, how he went to the cross, how he was brought back to life. He was raised by the Father from the dead so that he could be our Savior and so that our sin could be forgiven. It is a beautiful picture of the gospel, and it's the one Cornelius needed to hear. Amen? He didn't need to hear from Peter, yeah, Jesus is important, but let me talk to you about being a Jew. No, he needed to hear that forgiveness of his sin, being right with God, could only be accomplished by what Jesus did on the cross, and that that message was for him too. Cornelius needed that message, but can I tell you something? Peter needed to hear it too. As I stand here and preach the word of God this morning, you need to hear the message of the gospel, but guess what? I need to hear it too. As Peter is preaching this message, I think he's convicted by what he's preaching. Look, and here's why I say that. Look back at verses 34 and 35. He says, I most certainly understand now. I mean, don't you think he got it before? I mean, he walked with Jesus. Jesus said, Peter, don't call stuff unclean that I've said is clean, right? He even has a vision from God that says, Peter, stop calling it unclean, right? Kill and eat. But, it, but it's here in front of Cornelius as he's preaching the gospel, as he sees someone who needs this message and he begins to deliver it. He says, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. That in every nation, right? That's a really intricate Greek phrase, every nation. And here's what it means, every nation. It means all people, everyone, everyone, he says, who does what? Fears him. What does that mean? Places their trust in him, surrenders, submits to him. 
and does what is right. What does that mean? Following Jesus. It's an overflow of who you've placed your faith in, right? Fears him and does what is right. In this next phrase, he says, is welcome to him. Now, this really is an important phrase to understand. Because this idea of being welcome to God, this is not the phrase or the word that would be used for justification, being declared right before God, right? Having your sin forgiven, being declared righteous because of Jesus. That's not what Peter says, is that the one who fears God will be welcome to him. This is the word for favor. The idea of being liked, right, Be, being brought in, right, really part of the, 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 inner, the inner circle. Because So here's what Peter's dealing with here. The pollution that he needed cleaned up, that the clarity of the gospel clears up, is this right here. It's that Gentiles, not only could they be justified, I don't think that's what Peter's wrestling with. I don't think Peter is wrestling with whether or not the blood of Jesus can forgive the Gentiles of their sin. He's wrestling with whether they could be favored by God if they don't follow all of the Old Testament laws and the dietary laws. Are they favored by God simply by what Christ has done for them? That's the clarity of the gospel. And that's what Peter, as he's preaching it, I believe that's what he says, I see it now. That it is only through Christ and it is what he has done that gives us favor with the Father. It is nothing that we do, right? We don't clean ourselves up, right? It's not about clean versus unclean, things that we have to do in order to achieve it. It is what Christ has done for us. And so now here's Peter sharing the gospel. And for him, the most unusual of situations, right? I mean, I kind of picture Peter. It's like, okay, the gospel, it's for all of Jerusalem, okay? Not just our little group that's followed Jesus. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that. Oh, oh my goodness, now Philip's taking it to the Samaritans. Wait a minute, I don't know about this. Okay, I'm all right with that. But a eunuch, what? <sighs> okay, fine, I'm good with that. Paul? The guy that was killing us, the guy that was throwing us in prison, no way could the gospel be for him. Okay, well, he is a Jew. All right, so maybe, okay, it's a beautiful story, right? It's one of those powerful stories. We can use this, you know, to tell other people about Jesus. Sure, fine. And then the dream, you're kidding me, right? The Gentiles, we've got to take the gospel there? God, I don't want to do that. They make me uncomfortable, Right, I've spent my whole life avoiding them. Right, I've spent my whole life thinking they are less than. And you say the gospel is for them? Are there people in our lives that we feel that way about? I can tell you a quick story that to know how powerful it is, you would have to understand just my, my past. As, as a child, my family, we, we were in a church that legalism became such a big part of, of, of our life. This idea that we, that by the, our actions, by all the things we did, our religious activity, that is actually what made us clean before God. And so I will be here and stand here today and tell you I am a lifelong struggler with letting that go and realizing what actually justifies me before the Father is what Christ did, and it is not what I do. So I can tell you, I wrestle with that, but God had a really interesting sense of humor with me uh, as a young adult. I know I may not look like it now, but I used to play sports. And, um, and you know what, guys who played sports when they were young do typically is we play softball when we become old and we can't play baseball anymore and run quite as fast, so we play softball. So I found myself on a church softball team. And one of the guys on our team had a coworker that he had invited to play softball with us. Now, this guy he invited to play softball with us, 
right? He, can, he comes in and he's got like, you know, denim shorts on that hang like way past his knees. He, you know, in this, this time we would have called that like a skater look, right? He's got the shorts on down there, right? He comes in in this cutoff shirt. He is covered in tattoos, like sleeves everywhere on his face, right? Head shaved, earrings in both ears, right? I mean, he's dropping language that you don't typically hear at a church softball game, but, but you know, in the dugout, he's using it. Um, and, you know, but we're like, hey, this is, you know, but every Everybody's uncomfortable, right? Uh, it, all through the game, we're all uncomfortable. Well, I strike up a conversation with him, right? I'm one of the pastors of the church, by the way, of this team that we're playing on. Long story short, I find out this guy actually had just gotten out of prison in California. He had moved across the country to start over and get away from that old life. So he found himself in East Tennessee in the promised land. And, and he... Um, <laughs> He is living there, uh, and he's gotten a job, and he's working, and, um, and somebody invited him to play softball, so there he is. So we begin talking, and he goes, you're a preacher? And I said, yeah. He goes, I bet you don't like me, do you? I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I, he goes, I don't look like a Christian. And you know, that hit me. <laughs> I was like, what does a Christian look like? Was the thought going on in my head, right? Is it really, is that the message we send? is that it's about a look. <laughs> so we sit there in the dugout and I share the gospel with him. And you know, he gives his life to Christ sitting right there on the bench in the dugout. Guess what? The gospel was for him. A foul-mouthed <laughs> ex-con. It wasn't about cleaning himself up to get to Christ. It was about the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for him, that when he heard that message, he responded and gave his life to Christ. Isn't that powerful? And I'm convicted because as I sat there, I was judging him for nine innings. God's got a sense of humor. By the way, a few months later, that guy actually, I actually have a tattoo. Hey, guess who gave it to me? That guy. He was a tattoo artist. I let him give me a tattoo. It was the coolest thing. This guy that I led to Christ. So anyway, just a little story. Now, Luke, let's get back to the text. Because Luke wants his readers to ask, is the Holy Spirit going to fall on the Gentiles, right? Peter shares the gospel with, with Cornelius and his family, but what's going to happen? Right, are we gonna see the same pattern that we saw in Jerusalem in Acts 2 and then in Acts chapter eight with the Samaritans? What's gonna happen in Acts chapter 10? That's what we're gonna see in just a couple of minutes, but before we get there, we need to pause for just a minute because I want to address something that the text is addressing because I need to acknowledge there are people today who still struggle with this idea of do Christians need to keep the law of the Old Testament in order to really be favored by God. Like specifically, not just their version of the law, but the actual Mosaic law. Is that something that a Christian is obligated to keep in order to be favored by God? Right, the very thing Peter is wrestling with, there are people today who still struggle with that very thing. How do you interpret the law of the Old Testament? What is it for? And so I don't think we can go past this section of Acts without actually talking about it for a moment and seeing how the gospel brings clarity even to this struggle. So I want you to turn quickly to Galatians chapter three. I'm gonna start in verse 13. Look at what it says. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. So right away, Paul's not calling the law, and he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, right? And so if there's anyone who felt a little bit of you know, obligation and pull towards the law, it would have been Paul. But he says this about the law. It's not a badge of honor that a Christian should wear and feel obligated to. He says, no, it is actually a curse of the law. 
right? Look at, look at verse 14. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit. Is it through the law? It's through faith. Right, So the law is not the thing that brings blessing. Paul says the law is actually a curse. Right, it's a cur- It pronounces a curse on us because we can't keep it. We are incapable in our sin of keeping it. It is a curse to us. But the blessing comes from our faith that we can, the faith that we place in Jesus Christ. That is where faith, that's where the blessing comes from, right? That's where the Holy Spirit indwells us, not because we keep the law, but because we placed our faith in the one who kept it for us. Now look on down. We need to skip on down a little bit for the sake of time. Look at verse 21. It says, in the law then, con is the law contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. So we see what the law can't do. The law cannot give life, right? That's not the purpose of the law. But look at verse 24. It says, therefore, the law has become our tutor. Now, you need to understand when Paul uses the word our, he's talking about the Jews, not the Gentiles. He says the law has become our tutor, why? To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. He said, so listen, even for us Jews, the law is not how we are made right with God. It is faith in Christ. He says, but then he goes on, look at verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Who's the you? He's talking about the Gentiles, He says, you're not under the law. He said, by the way, as Jews, we're not either because Christ has come. But he says, for the Gentiles, you don't need to be bound by this burden of keeping the law, right? It is through Christ that you have been justified because you have all been, you have been baptized into Christ, verse 27. Verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all. Jew and Gentile, one in Christ Jesus, right? The Mosaic law was never meant to be worn as a badge of honor to those who were trying to please God because it cannot make us righteous. Flip over, if you will, for just a minute to Colossians chapter three. In Colossians, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter two, look at verse 16. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to the festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. All language about the ceremonial laws and practices of the old covenant, right? He says these things are a what? Mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ, He's saying, listen, the only value these things have is that they point us to Jesus. That is their purpose, is pointing us to Jesus. And he talks a little bit more about it, and then he jumps down in verse 20 with an important question. He says, why do you continue to submit yourself to these things, to these decrees, like don't handle and don't taste and don't touch? All these things which are destined to perish, In verse 23, he says they have the appearance of wisdom, but they are of no value. Church, we need to hear, because remember we said that there's a pressing need for gospel clarity in our lives in order to make sure there's no polluting of the gospel message for us and for those that we will share it with. We need to make sure we understand, and if we had time, we would go into it today. We would walk through and see how every one of the laws in the Mosaic Covenant, all of the feasts, all of the ceremonies, all of the rituals, all of the cleansings, all of the things that are prescribed in in the Old Testament that the Jewish people were to follow, they were all to point to Christ, and they were all fulfilled by him. 
right? He is who makes us clean. It is not the keeping of the law. It is not eating certain things. It is not, it is not, it is not certain feasts and certain, certain laws of the Old Testament that we have to keep in order to be made clean before God, right? Not just sin forgiven, but to be clean and right with God. Those are not the things that put us in right standing with him. It is only the blood of Jesus because he is the fulfillment of all of that and he has credited to our account through his death on the cross for us. Amen? So that is the purpose of those laws. And, and that is important for us to know. Because as we are communicating the gospel, we need to be able to do so with love and compassion to help people who may be struggling with letting go of certain things in order to take hold of Christ and to rest in his finished work and not worry and, and struggle with whether there are certain things they must do in order to be in right standing with God, amen? And it's Christ who makes us clean. A guy by the name of Augustus Montague Toplady, who's a pastor in the 1700s, he knew people in his day were wrestling with this, and he was also a hymn writer. And so he wrote a hymn called Rock of Ages. And in that hymn, listen to what he says. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know and could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, thou alone. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. It is Jesus, amen? amen. And it is only Jesus. And when Cornelius hears that, look what happens in verse 44, because the transforming power of gospel realities are what are ours to experience when we have the purity of the gospel. And that's what we see here, starting in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Do you see it? In Acts 2, the Spirit fell at Pentecost when the gospel was preached. In Acts chapter 8, the Spirit fell on the Samaritans when the gospel was preached. And now, right, the question that's been hanging in the balance is the gospel for all people and all nations. The gospel is preached. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He falls. He falls on the Gentiles. This is huge. The Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening to the message. Even the circumcised believers, verse 45, who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. And Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit. I love this just as we did. Church, don't miss this. Don't miss what's happening here. When the simple message of who Jesus is and what he did and how we are made right by the him, when that message is preached, the Holy Spirit moves in power. Right, This is clear for us to understand the gospel is for everybody. The Jews, the Samaritans, the Gentiles, the guy in the dugout, your neighbor, your family member that you think is far from God and doesn't want anything to do with the message of the gospel, guess what? It is for them. Amen. The people who believe in everything that you oppose the gospel is for them. The Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles is this stamp of guarantee, this statement by God that declares the gospel is for everyone. 
but not a polluted gospel that says you've gotta clean yourself up and look like me in order for me to share it. But it is just the simple message of Jesus that we must take and we must share. That is the point of this passage that we're looking at this morning, right? In order for us to experience the transforming power of the gospel, we've gotta communicate the purity of the gospel. Because look what happens when they do. Cornelius, this God-fearer who's still missing it, dead in his sin, he now has life. He's exalting God. Right? We see God's plan of redemption that the Bible said was in place before the foundation of the world. We now see it going beyond the border of the Jews and the Samaritans to now the whole world. Right, This sovereign God is accomplishing his plan of redemption and it is going to the ends of the earth. We see that the Jews who thought they were the closest to cleanliness and the Romans who, the, who they thought were the furthest, we now see the transforming power of the gospel is that no one can be clean unless they are declared so by God through the finished work of Jesus, amen? That is both humbling and freeing and can I tell you that as believers, we need both? We need to be set free from the trappings of legalism, but we need to be humbled by there is nothing we can do to be a better Christian than the person beside us. And finally, that their identity was rooted in Christ and only him, right? The reality of the gospel is that it's the gospel that defines us. Church, we can't get away from it. Right? We don't graduate past it. Our life is hidden with Christ. We need the gospel preached to ourselves every day. I want you to look at a quote with me as we begin to, to bring this to an end today. D.A. Carson said, so within the church of the living God, we must become excited about the gospel. And then he goes on to talk about these things that sometimes we get more excited about. And he says, if instead the gospel increasingly becomes for us that which we assume, then we will, of course, assent to the correct creedal statement. But when we just assume it, we, we start thinking other things are more important. This style of preaching, this version of counseling, this style of worship music, or, or this way of living. And he says, but at this point, when those are the things we are chasing after, the gospel is not what really captures us. Rather, it is, it is those forms of worship. It is a style of counseling. It's a particular view of culture. He says, ultimately, that thing becomes our center. And the generation after us Look what happens, loses the gospel. As soon as you get to the place where the gospel is that which is merely assumed, you are only a generation and a half from death. So church, I wanna ask you this morning, are you excited about the gospel? Are you excited to take the gospel to the Corneliuses of your world? Do you believe that the message of the gospel is for them? We need to be excited about the beauty and the purity of the message of Jesus Christ that is ours and that it is ours to take to others. So I wanna ask you this morning, you've been hearing us talk about something we're calling witness as we lead up to Easter. We've said it's three, two, one. We want you to be praying for three people who don't know Christ. We want you to pray about opportunities to share the gospel with at least two of those. And then we want you to pray about and identify one family, one person that you could have in your home for a meal. Why would we do that? There's nothing magical about a meal, about inviting someone in your home, but my goodness, there is a beautiful pattern in scripture when people are invited in Right, Noah inviting his family into the ark, right, and they were saved. Rahab bringing her family into her home, right? David inviting Jonathan's son to sit at his table, right? The early Christians fellowshipping together in their homes, breaking bread and in fellowship. There is something powerful 
and something intimate about inviting someone in to your home, into your life that gives value, that shows significance. And so we're asking you, who could you invite into your home this season to begin to get to know, to begin to pray and find opportunities to share the gospel with them? And we wanna help you do that. And so today, when you leave out in the plaza, Chad will be out there with these boxes, these kits. And in these kits, you will find an HEB gift card to help you pay for the meal. We know groceries are expensive, and so we wanna help you be able to buy the things you need for a meal. And then there's a table of contents in this box with tools that you can use, conversation starters, like little tools that you can use. And you'll find all that content in this box to help take any of the obstacles out of the way that might prevent you from being able to just simply welcome someone in your home. Why would we do that? Because we're excited about the gospel. Because we know the gospel can change a life. And when we make ourselves available, the Holy Spirit can use us. And so this morning, I'm inviting you. Who are you gonna have into your home? How can you take the pure gospel message to someone else? In just a minute, we're gonna stand to our feet and we're gonna sing a song of closing, a time of response. Maybe this time of response for you is just a time for you to come to this altar and pray for the family you're gonna have in your home. Maybe the time of response for you is to come to this altar and just confess and repent of ways that you've polluted the gospel in your thinking and in your living. Maybe today the response time for you is to come to Jesus. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. However God is moving, we want to invite you today to respond to the gospel. Father, would you take your word this morning? God, would you use it to pierce our hearts? God, would you allow the gospel to transform us? God, would you work in our hearts now about who we should invite into our homes this season. God, would you have your way, but God, most of all, would you make us excited about the gospel and its power to reach everyone in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet as we sing?